Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Washington. For those of, you, those of you from out of town on a very beautiful day here in, in Washington, D.C., uh, we want to welcome you all here today to recognize Ambassador Loeb for his extraordinary foresight and generosity as we officially today acknowledge the establishment of the Ambassador John L. Loeb, Jr. Institute for Religious Freedom at the George Washington University. Now, it's been an honor and a pleasure working with Ambassador Loeb and his colleagues to bring the Institute and its academic programs and educational partnerships right here to GW. And we look forward to much collaboration, continued collaboration with Ambassador Loeb uh, and all of those who have worked so hard uh, to make this institute uh, a success. Now, the motive behind our convening should serve to remind us that our nation and our world are founded upon some essential, timeless philosophical questions. As William Bro Adams, the chair and director of the NEH, National Endowment of Humanities, often states, underlying our democracy are core issues of freedom and liberty incubated in the era of the Enlightenment and resonant with many cultures and peoples throughout the globe. How are we to live? How are we to interact with our brethren what defines life and our humanity? The Loeb Institute allows us, beginning now, to wrestle with and explore these questions to a degree that we've not been able to do institutionally before. So thank you, Ambassador Loeb, for helping guide the path forward in addressing some of these key questions, the key questions of our times, and some of the key issues that are underlying our essential humanity. I'd like now to invite to the podium the 16th president of the George Washington University, Dr. Stephen Knapp. Well, thank you very much, Dean Vincent. It's a pleasure to join you here today. I think this is a very exciting occasion, and it's a rare opportunity to be able to bring uh, such an important uh, program to our university, where I really think it does belong for reasons that you've already heard a little bit about, and I'll go into a little more detail about some of those. But we're very honored to celebrate the establishment of the Ambassador John L. Loeb, Jr. Institute for Religious Freedom right here in the heart of our nation's capital. And I'd like to acknowledge a few of those who have joined us among our many distinguished guests. We have uh, uh, the Honorable David Saperstein, who is the United States Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, we're going to be joined a little bit later by um, Congressman David Cicilline, um, who has a Rhode Island connection, which will, I'll, that, that'll be relevant, as you'll see in a moment, uh, but also is a good uh, friend of uh, Ambassador Loeb's. And then we have um, with us also Ambassador Philip Hughes and his wife, Victoria Nipper Hughes, Ambassador Hughes. And, uh, and we have uh, Ambassador Gilbert A. Robinson. And, of course, our guest of honor, Ambassador John L. Loeb, Jr., we really are delighted that the George Washington University will be the home of the Loeb Institute because, um, as I think everyone here knows, our namesake was a very strong advocate for religious freedom. You've heard a little bit from the dean about how the ideas of the Enlightenment, which included religious toleration and then religious freedom, uh, became such an important part of the fabric of our American democracy. But one of the strongest statements in the history of the development of those ideas was in the letter that George Washington wrote on the 18th of August, 1790, to the Hebrew congregation of Newport, uh, Rhode Island. And I think this is language that's familiar to many of you, but I'm going to just quote a little bit of it, of this letter, because uh, Washington, as often was the case, did something very subtle but very important for the future. A number of things that, that Washington did that really set the pattern for the future of our democracy. One of those was deciding not to be crowned as a king at the end of the revolution. That was a big one. Uh, and also uh, to set the precedent of serving, uh, which was, was not always uh, maintained, but the precedent of serving two terms in office, uh, not wearing a military uniform, but choosing to wear civilian uh, garb uh, in his office of, of president, and in fact, um, essentially at the end of the war, retiring. And, and you may know the story that King George III, when he was told by the uh, great uh, painter Benjamin West that uh, uh, King George III asked uh, West what were uh, Washington's plans at the end of the war, at the end of the Revolutionary War, and he said he's going to retire. And uh, the king replied, if he does that, he will be the greatest man in the world. He, really appreciating that. And that's, of course, how he got to be known as Cincinnatus after the Roman general who, uh, who retired at the end of, uh, of his military service. 
But the other thing he did was to distinguish in a very subtle and I think important way between uh, the ideal of toleration made famous by John Locke and others. Uh, Locke wrote an essay of toleration uh, at the turn of the, of the, of the previous century, uh, in, in the turn of the 17th to 18th century. Uh, but Washington very pointedly distinguished what he was uh, promoting from toleration in the following terms. He wrote uh, to the Hebrew congregation, the citizens of the United States of America have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it was by the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. So not toleration, but liberty as a natural right, religious liberty, religious freedom as a natural right. And then that became, of course, enshrined in our United States Constitution. So I think it's very, uh, very critically um, uh, an important moment. And of course, we are proud to associate ourselves with the legacy of George Washington as this in so many other respects. And we were known for a number of decades in the previous century. We were known as an institution that was welcome to uh, students from all religious communities to a, to a greater extent than many of our uh, fellow institutions. So we're very, uh, I think it's very appropriate that we will be housing this uh, important institute on our campus. So Ambassador Loeb, you are, we're very excited to embark on this new partnership with you. You are truly a champion of religious freedom and you truly represent the highest ideals of patriotism and of statesmanship in the commitments you've exhibited through your entire life. We're deeply grateful to you and to Sharon, who I knew could not be with us uh, today, for your vision and leadership and delighted above all to welcome you both to the George Washington University family. And so now we actually have to raise. So uh, in recognition of your vision, your leadership, your dedication to the ideals of American democracy, and in particular the ideal of religious freedom, I raise a glass in your honor, sir. You're here. You're here. Thank you. And now I, I, uh, I have to, I'm afraid I have to go to another obligation across town, but I'm going to leave you in good hands by returning the podium to Dean Ben Vincent III. Thank you very much. President Knapp, thank you so much. We appreciate your deep commitment to grooming leaders who are thoughtful and conversant on issues that are elemental to the core of the Loeb Institute's mission to foster dialogue, tolerance, and understanding. Uh, I also just wanted to mention very briefly as well that uh, uh, we're making history in a number of ways today. Uh, of course, we are, uh, we are actually launching the Institute formally today, but we're also uh, inaugurating this particular room in the Fairmont. Uh, so <laughs> this is the first time I think there's ever been an event here. Uh, so uh, enjoy your lunch, and uh, we will continue after uh, uh, over, over coffee and dessert. Thanks. I'm incredibly pleased this afternoon to introduce to you the new director of the Loeb Institute, Dr. Sam Goldman. He's a Columbian College assistant professor of political science. He is the head of our politics and values program. He holds a PhD in political science from Harvard, and he was the Tikva postdoctoral fellow in religion, ethics, and politics at Princeton before coming to GW in 2013. Uh, we both arrived at the same time. A scholar of the theological sources of political ideas, he has published essays on historic figures, including Tocqueville, Spinoza, Leo Strauss, and he's currently completing a book about Christian Zionism and American thought. In addition to his academic work, Professor Goldman is a contributing editor to the American Conservative. Goldman's writing has also appeared in the National Review, in Modern Age, New York Magazine, First Things, The New Criterion, and other publications. I deeply look forward to working with Sam to foster greater awareness of the nation's historic roots of religious freedom, the separation of church and state, and the continuing relevance of the American tradition of religious diversity. We together envision that the Loeb Institute will be transformational for our students, 
for our faculty, and for those in our community as they address the pressing issues of religious diversity and freedom in contemporary society. We foresee implementing educational programs on and off campus, working collaboratively with faculty across the disciplines, leveraging our relationships with embassies, developing new programmatic initiatives, planning conferences and events. And as I recently learned in conversation with others at the table, maybe even a prize to, uh, to members of, of Congress uh, who are working or have exemplified uh, excellent stature in this field. At this time, I'd love to invite Professor Sam Goldman to the podium to say a few words. Thanks. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Vincent, for that very generous introduction. Um, and thank you also, and more importantly, to Ambassador Loeb for his extraordinary generosity. Uh, it's a great honor to be selected as director uh, of the Institute for Religious Freedom that bears his name. And I look forward to working with Ambassador Loeb, with Dean Vincent, uh, and also with the faculty and staff of George Washington University uh, to make the Loeb Institute a center for the study and promotion of what George Washington called our inherent natural rights. This opportunity is especially exciting for me uh, as a scholar of political thought. Um, as my teachers and my colleagues continue to document in various ways, the very concept of limited government was born in struggles about the public role of religion in 17th century Europe. In an era of persecution, uh, great political thinkers, including James Harrison, uh, Harrington, uh, Benedict Spinoza, and John Locke, argued that the state is not a church and that religious minorities should not be subjected to official disfavor. We take these arguments for granted today, but they were dangerous at the time. Those dangerous ideas were institutionalized here in the United States. Uh, but as President Knapp has pointed out, uh, the US Constitution goes beyond what the political philosophers of the 17th century dared to suggest. In his letter to the Hebrew congregation of Newport, George Washington wrote that it is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it were the indulgence of one class of people that enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States, which gives, no, to, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. So under the Constitution, we move from freedom of private worship and instruction, uh, and essentially private form of liberty to a public freedom, to the right and duty of adherence of all faiths and traditions to act as equal citizens of our republic. So in many ways, the story of the United States is a story of religious freedom. And the better we understand that story, the better we understand ourselves as Americans. And that's one reason that it's so important to promote the work of scholars from many disciplines on these issues. But religious freedom is not simply an academic concern. A uh, few issues are more timely today. Just look at the headlines. Uh, from cases about exemptions from the Affordable Care Act recently argued before the Supreme Court, to disputes about the nature of marriage, to responses to the plight of Christians under ISIS, uh, tensions between church and state, religion and politics are as important as they were 200 years ago. Now, our goal cannot be to avoid controversy because controversy, uh, as Locke and James Madison remind us, is unavoidable so long as men and women are free to make use of their own faculties of reason and conscience. So our goal must be to provide a forum in which citizens can articulate their views in a manner consistent with the best traditions of our republic. In providing a forum for reflection and debate about religious freedom, 
the Institute will promote the virtue of civility. And civility doesn't just mean being nice to each other. Um, it's the ability to act as citizens by participating in common deliberation on topics that arouse our deepest passions. And there is no better model of civility than the process that gave us our Constitution and added its first 10 amendments, uh, including, of course, the First Amendment that guarantees not only um, that no church will be established, but also that citizens retain the right to exercise their religion. Yet the challenges we face today are tougher in some ways than those that our founding fathers uh, anticipated. They were worried mostly about relations between Christian denominations and between Christians and Jews. But we have to figure out how to balance the rights and the responsibilities of citizens professing a much broader variety of faiths, uh, including those who exercise their right to have none at all. And we have to do this at a time when domestic institutions and national boundaries seem much less significant than they did just a few decades ago. For that reason, George Washington University is an ideal setting for the Loeb Institute. With its religiously, politically, and culturally diverse student body, uh, it serves as a microcosm of our pluralistic society. As a center for scholarship and debate, the Institute will help prepare students to preserve the traditions that they inherit while living and working in an increasingly globalized world. And in this respect, the Institute will further GW's mission of putting knowledge into action. Washington concluded his letter to the Hebrew congregation by asking that the father of all mercies scatter light and not darkness upon our paths and make us all in our several vocations useful here. So I'll conclude by expressing my sincere hope to meet this standard as director of the Institute. Uh, and again, my gratitude to Ambassador Loeb, uh, to Dean Vincent, and to President Knapp, and also to this distinguished audience um, for their support. So thank you very much, uh, and I am ready to get to work. Thank you for those wonderful remarks, Doctor. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce the Honorable David N. Ciceline, a congressman representing the great state of Rhode Island, where President George Washington's historic letter to the Hebrew congregation in Newport was first read and received. Congressman? Thank you, Dean. I was fearful you were going to say that I was present when it was first read. <laughs> um, I am really delighted to be here uh, at this very important occasion uh, uh, to say thank you and congratulations to my wonderful friend and the great ambassador, John Loeb. Uh, first, uh, to Professor Goldman, congratulations on uh, being the inaugural leader of the new institute, and uh, thank you for your beautiful words, and I wish you well in the important work that you'll do at the institute. Uh, as all of you know, Ambassador Loeb has dedicated his entire life to public service. He served our country in the United States Air Force from 1954 to 1956. He was chairman of the New York State Council on Environmental Advisors from 1970 to 1975. The United States Ambassador to Denmark from 1981 to 1983. A delegate to the 38th session of the United Nations General Assembly and today serves as chairman of the Winston Churchill Foundation of the United States and the John Loeb Foundation, as well as many other things which I know are detailed in his biography. But what I want to just take a moment to point out is that Ambassador Loeb is also descended from the Turos of Newport, Rhode Island, which is in my district. Um, Isaac Turo was the leader of the Jewish congregation that opened the Turo Synagogue in 1763. And today it is the oldest synagogue building still standing in all of North America. And as Professor Goldman just uh, re uh, recited, the very important letter uh, from President Washington in 1790 to the congregation in Newport uh, that he sent after he visited uh, the congregation along with then Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson. 
And this letter really remains one of our nation's first and most important uh, affirmations of religious freedom. Uh, President Washington wrote those words, which we have heard and are on your table. Happily, the government of the United States gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. And he continued by saying, may the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants, while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. And so it's incredibly fitting and uh, wonderful that the descendant, or, or a descendant of Isaac Toro, is today responsible for the establishment of this new Institute for Religious Freedom at George Washington University. Ambassador Loeb's incredibly generous gift is helping to strengthen President Washington's legacy as a champion of religious liberty. And it builds on the work uh, that has already begun uh, through the George Washington Institute for Religious Freedom, which Ambassador Loeb founded in 2009 in New York City, and also builds on the work that Ambassador Loeb did in connection with the Toro Synagogue uh, to create a center there of, uh, of learning and education to really promote the principles of religious freedom. Uh, the Ambas Ambassador John L. Loeb Jr. Institute for Religious Freedom at GW is going to continue a dialogue in the importance of religious freedom in our country, the separation of church and state, and the idea that all religious traditions are welcome in our great country. And as has been mentioned, in our current political environment, uh, Mr. Loeb's generosity and his commitment to relig religious freedom is especially valuable, and I hope will be a beacon of light to people all over our country and all over the world about the importance of respecting each other's religious traditions. So I am, feel very especially honored to be here today to celebrate this important moment, to say thank you to my good friend and the generous benefactor of the Institute, Ambassador Loeb, and to thank GW for the work that you are doing and will continue to do in this very important era. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Congressman. Uh, I'd also like, uh, before, uh, before proceeding to the next uh, phase of the program, to acknowledge members of our inaugural board, faculty board, uh, of the Institute uh, for Religious Freedom. So if all of you who are, who are here, who are members of our board, if you could just please raise your hand. I want to thank and, and recognize all of you uh, for, for participating. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce Ambassador John L. Loeb, Jr. Uh, when I had a chance to look over his, his accomplishments, career accomplishments, again last night, um, I, I, there was only one other person in the office uh, at, at that time. It was late. Jenny was working hard. Um, and I know she must have heard me laugh. Um, and I actually went to her and said, oh my goodness, this guy has had quite a career. Uh, it would take me 20, 30 minutes to go through everything that he's accomplished. Uh, but let me uh, just give you a sample. Ambassador John L. Loeb, his public career includes service as UM, U.S. Ambassador to Denmark from 1981 to 1983, and as a delegate to the 38th session of the U.N. General Assembly. Ambassador Loeb also served as an advisor to Governor Nelson Rockefeller on environmental and economic affairs from 1967 to 1970, and chairman of the Governor's New York State Council of Environmental Advisors from 1970 to 1975. Ambassador Loeb currently serves as chairman of the Winston Churchill Foundation of the United States and the John L. Loeb Jr. Foundation. He is also vice chairman of the Council of American Ambassadors and an executive trustee of the Scandinavian Foundation and a member of its investment committee. Just slight accomplishments. Among his numerous awards and recognitions is the designation of the Commander of the Order of the British Empire bestowed by Queen Elizabeth II in 1994 for his work with the Winston Churchill Foundation of the United States. He also holds the title of Knight of the Grand Cross of the Order of Dannenbrog, uh, received from Queen Margaret uh, II of Denmark. I'm sure I butchered that. And he also holds an honorary Doctorate of Laws from Georgetown University. Again, I could go on and on. But most importantly, Ambassador Loeb is an American statesman 
and a patriot without peer. He's a defender and advocate of our freedoms. He's a beloved and cherished friend of the George Washington University. Without further ado, I give you Ambassador John L. Lowe. and Ben, thank you for those wonderful remarks. I can't tell you how excited and thrilled <clears throat> I am here to be, be here today with all of you. And uh, I was delighted to meet uh, Professor Goodman. I loved your talk just now. I think we're all on the same wavelength. And uh, I'm really thrilled and inspired that that in a way, George Washington University, we reached out together to each other to pursue this interest in religious freedom. Today, as you all know, the world is torn by religious conflict. The new Loeb Institute at George Washington University will not be the answer to this age-old pro age problem, but it could be a significant response to the rampant acts of bigotry and hatred engulfing our world. It is my hope that the extraordinary talents at George Washington University will help stem this dangerous tide. My concern with religious freedom originates from a very personal and dramatic experience of constant anti-Semitic harassment starting at the age of nine when I was sent away to a boarding school. From that day to the present, I have tried to understand the vicious and baseless hatred of Jews. That study has led me to a broader search for antidotes to religious intolerance in general, not just anti-Semitism. Over the past few decades, I've read widely among the world's great thinkers in this, on this subject. I found what is for me a singular voice that expresses the most cogent and direct rebuke to religious bigotry, that bigotry. That person is none other than the individual for whom this university is named George Washington. In 1790, Washington wrote a letter to the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island. He wrote that letter soon after his visit to Newport to mark Rhode Island's ratification of the U.S. Constitution in 1790. Rhode Island was the last state to just to ratify the Constitution. Now, when you hear the words of George Washington's letter read aloud, which you've heard some bit of, to me, it is a clarion call which has echoed down the centuries. I was going to read a few sentences from George Washington's letter, but you've all beaten me to it, so I won't, <laughs> I won't quote them. But to me, this letter, I'm passionate about. I discovered this uh, when I was in college, and it's been an inspiration for my whole life since then. And one must remember that no head of state at that time, in 1791, had ever said such words. With the establishment of the Loeb Institute for Religious Freedom at the George Washington University, I have every hope that generations of scholars and students from George Washington University and throughout our country and perhaps across the world will read Washington's letter. I also hope that public officials and policymakers everywhere <clears throat> will enact the profound principles in that letter. Washington got it right. All people have an inherent natural right to their beliefs. 
so long as they conduct themselves as good citizens and respect the rights of others. I want to thank all of you for coming today to celebrate. I can't tell you at this lunch for the Loeb Institute, I can't tell you how much it means to me. Thank you. I want to thank President Knapp. I only have Dean Vincent, Professor Goldman, David Cicilline, Gil Robinson, Phil Horn, all the people who I've met here and who are some are not here. And I urge, and I, I want to thank all those who have already become excited around the university by the possibilities of the Loeb Institute. And I urge all of you who are interested or engaged in similar efforts to reach out to the Loeb Institute so that together we can make this world a safer, more humane, more tolerant place. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program, but in, in closing, let me say, uh, as I started today, I, today's talk, and I did say that today is a beautiful day. Um, today, the, the sun shines a little brighter, the, the wind blows a little softer, the leaves whisper a little lighter, uh, because the George Washington University has the Loeb Institute to launch. And I again want to ex extend sincere thanks to, to Ambassador Loeb for his, for his foresight and his gift, for all of you in the audience for your, for your support, uh, and we look forward to a bright future ahead. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>